Good evening, everyone. Those of you joining us tonight for gardening in a changing climate. Uh, we're just going to take a couple minutes here to let everyone join the broadcast, and then we'll get started with our uh, featured guest and esteemed partner, Melinda mm -hmm. Myers. So, um, so thanks for your patience. We'll get started in just a moment here. Hello to everyone joining us tonight for Gardening in a Changing Climate. Just giving everyone uh, another moment here to join the broadcast, and then we'll get started with the presentation. Um, for your reference, I have put a link to Melinda's handout in the chat box. Um, if you've registered for this program before four o'clock today, uh, you receive this in your email as well. And we'll hand it or hand it out. We'll send it out again after uh, the program um, when the recording goes out in a few days. All right, so why don't we go ahead and get started. So hello again, everyone. My name is Kelly Walter. I am the Adult Programming Coordinator at Milwaukee Public Library. Uh, thanks so much for spending your evening with us. We're very excited to welcome Melinda Myers back for Gardening in a Changing Climate. Um, just uh, a few um, things to know about tonight, you will see your microphone is muted and your cameras are off. Uh, we will have time at the end of the program for your questions for Melinda, so please feel free to drop those in the Q&A. Um, we will get to those at the end of the program. Also, please feel free to chat amongst yourselves in the chat box, which you can see on the bottom of your screen. If you check the chat right now, I've dropped a link in there to the handout that we'll be using this evening. Um, and in a couple of days, you'll receive a link to this recording along with that handout as well. So um, I think we're ready to get started. Let me hand it over to Melinda. Thank you so much again for um, joining us tonight and for presenting on another uh, fascinating topic for us. Well, thank you, Kelly, and um, I appreciate all of you joining us. Um, if you are in the Milwaukee area, we finally have some nice weather, so I really appreciate anybody who's sacrificing a nice weather, which has been limited this spring for many of us across the country. Thanks for taking time to join us on such an important topic. And I always like to start by thanking our sponsor, We Energy, who's sponsoring not only this webinar, but the whole program that we've partnered with the public libraries of Wisconsin and the Upper Peninsula Michigan libraries as well. Talk a little bit more about that later. But tonight we're going to focus on gardening practices to help you adapt to a changing climate. And the other thing is, as gardeners, adapting so that we can be more successful in our gardens. So you know, as a gardener, you know that it's all about the weather, the climate, we'll talk about the difference, rainfall, temperature, soil needs to be good. How much time do you have to put into your garden? How much time does your garden need? So we're going to talk about things that we can do that will help you be successful and help with climate change. You know, as I was preparing for this and I did an article recently and was reminded, you know, the difference between weather and climate, and sometimes we use those interchangeably, but weather are those changes that come immediately. We watch the news, we go, oh, it's gonna rain tomorrow. Oh, it's cloudy today. I took this picture in my garden, I think it was Sunday, and look at those clouds rolling in. So it's about humid, it's about those short changes, things that happen more on a day-to-day -day basis, where climate is more of those long-term changes and the average minimum winter temperature the average heat in the summer, the length of the frost season. 
and how those things have changed. When I was looking for a drought image, Don, who works with me, found this one and felt that this really kind of explains it all across the country. Um, many parts of the country have experienced drought. We had in the southern Wisconsin a hot, dry summer the last couple of years. I cannot complain to my friends in California. And yes, they've gotten a lot of snow and rain, but the drought has been so long term and extended, they're still going to feel that problem. And then all the problems with the heavy precipitation. Um, I found this, there's a link to the document where I found these maps in your handout, and it talks about some of the difference. It's out of Pennsylvania State University, I think was the place. And this just shows heavy precipitation. So those of you who've joined me for rain gardens, managing water where it falls, knows this is one of my missions. As gardeners, it seems we get a lot of rain, maybe when we don't need it, and not enough when we do. And we're experiencing more and more heavy uh, periods of heavy precipitation. So what does that mean? Flash floods, eroded soil, uh, storm sewers overflowing. And you can see kind of how those changes have occurred across the country. And that impacts us as gardeners. Then looking at extreme heat. Last year, um, one of my clients is Plant Skid. Their offices are based in Vancouver and they had temperatures of 104 degrees. Very unusual for that part. That's usually a climate. The Pacific Northwest is usually a little milder, a little cooler in the summer. And you can see that this is just a prediction of dangerous heat. Now for us, we know the health risks, but for our plants, when temperatures are 86 degrees or above, many plants suffer. Um, they could have some short-term or long-term damage. It may stress them. They may have scorched leaves. They may decline. They won't be productive. Tomatoes and peppers, when it's hot at night or even during the day, uh, the flowers and the pollen aren't viable, so you don't get fruit. When it's too cold, the opposite happens. So that extreme heat, those periods of extreme heat affect us as well as our garden plants. Um, we keep talking about the changing climate. And one of the challenges that we're seeing is even though that Arbor Day Foundation hardiness map created some changes. And you could look at the map on the top. It talks about how many zone changes. So depending on where you live, you may have no changes in the hardiness uh, zone where you live. And in some, you may have one or two changes. I'm in Wisconsin, in southeast Wisconsin, and I'm kind of at the no change area. Um, one of the things to keep in mind, and this is what a lot of breeders are looking at, is looking for plants that tolerate extreme heat that a lot of us experience, but then also those cold snaps. You know, and sometimes it may not be the average of the winter, but we had a cold snap here in November where the temperatures dropped down in the teens. You know, prior to that, it was warm. So that quick transition is hard on plants, especially early in the fall and winter when they haven't had time to harden off. So it's not only about extremes, but that transition from one to the other frost-free season is getting longer. As you can see, depending on where you live, we're getting a longer growing period. Now, the downside, if you have allergies, they're finding that there's more pollen, uh, more things are, um, the plants are more vigorous because they have a longer season, so they're producing more flowers and pollen. So allergies, um, we're seeing an increase in allergies. A lot of the allergists are feeling that that then impacts respiratory diseases and asthma, so people are suffering more. I have hay fever, so I picked a great profession, but I've noticed an increase. For a while there, I was thinking, oh, my allergies are getting better as I'm getting older, but with this intensity, I'm seeing and talking to others who are feeling that as well. Now, on the other hand, we're also ex having some extreme late winter storms. So some of our plants may have started to leaf out, started to flower, and temperatures drop and they may be damaged. So snow isn't always the worst thing. It's a great insulator, but it's the cold temperatures that may be a problem. So it's all about extremes and changes. So how can we deal with this and also be part of the solution in creating a climate friendly garden? So we're going to talk about how we manage our soil, our plants, our yard waste and water to be more climate friendly. So not only will our gardens grow better, but we make a positive impact organic matter. A lot of our soils, most of us start with less than ideal soil. You know, they dug our basements, 
if you have basements, spread that top. They scraped off the topsoil, spread the subsoil over, threw an inch of topsoil on, put a tree, some lawn in, and called it a landscape. And then you spend years trying to fix it. So adding organic matter is a way to improve drainage in heavy soils, increase water absorption in general. So water is absorbed rather than runs off. For sandy, rocky soils, it helps hold the soil. And research out of Cornell found that especially compost enriched soils promote better plant health and those plants are more resistant to insects and disease and put out a good robust root system that can absorb more water. So organic matter is very important in this whole process. So one of our goals as gardeners, because we know soil is the foundation for a healthy uh, garden and landscape, is to preserve and improve our soil. This is at Morton Arboretum. And they did a nice job of, they've got lots of perennials. We'll talk about that benefit. They put leaves to work in their landscape. So that's a nice mulch to keep it covered and also improve. So we want to try to minimize soil disturbance. Many of you, myself included, grew up with regularly tilling the soil. You work it up. My dad, who was a great gardener, every spring would turn over the garden soil. We'd hauled manure from my grandparents' farm up in the trunk of our car, and he'd incorporate it in the garden. And he grew great vegetables. But what we're finding out is soil is a carbon sink. And the less we disturb it, the less CO2 that's released into the atmosphere and better for our plants. So if you've got a decent soil already, top dressing with compost is a great thing to do. Research also found that one or two inches of compost spread over a perennial garden will improve the growth and you'll need to add less fertilizer or maybe even none. Let the plants be your guide. So that's a great reason to use compost. With lawns, research found a quarter inch of compost spread over the soil surface over your lawn do that twice a year. That's a great way to add the nutrients that your lawn needs, improve the soil, and it's often sufficient and you won't need synthetic fertilizers. Um, there are some compost spreaders. I was doing a little pricing, anywhere from $200 to $400, depending on the size. So if you're thinking about spreading compost by the shovel, which I tried to do in my small city lot, and it wore me out and I had hardly any grass, that would be a better option for you. And that just, you fill up the spreader, roll it, and it spreads the compost. So it might be something to invest in if you're looking at improving your lawn. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Maybe you want to start a new garden. Here's a garden we featured in Melinda's Garden Moment. So we edge the garden bed, cut the grass and weeds really short, threw down some cardboard, or you could use newspaper, and covered it with mulch. The idea here is um, you can do this around trees and shrubs, and then it really reduces weeds. Or if you're starting this bed, you can do this, cut through the cardboard and the turf below and plant right away. I did this in my garden when I was in the city and that was a lot of work. So I decided that I set up my garden in the spring. I planted the end of summer. So the turf had died back. The cardboard and newspaper were starting to decompose. It was a lot easier. Or maybe you do it in the fall when you have lots of leaves available um, or you could use wood chip mulch and then plant the following spring when it's easier. But it's a great way to set up a garden without any chemicals, without renting a sod cutter by taking advantage because when that turf dies back, whether it's grass or weeds, when that dies back, it adds organic matter. The roots are in there helping to hold the soil in place. One of my favorite methods is lasagna gardening. I, I mentioned that I lived in the city for 26 years in Milwaukee, small city lot. I always worked my soil using organic mulches, adding organic material, um, very minimal fertilization. And I had great soil after 26 years. Well, I moved and now I'm in sand and rock country and my I don't have 26 years left to amend the soil. So I started enlisting lasagna gardening. And this is a strategy a plant, Pat, excuse me, Pat Lanza wrote the book Lasagna Gardening, and she started this when she was 55, newly divorced. She, I think, is in Vermont or someplace with rocky soil and decided, I can't till, I'm going to put my plant waste, like you see here in my wheelbarrow, to work creating garden soil. So you can create a raised bed, 
standing on its own or use a raised bed frame, fill it with this material using lasagna gardening. So it, we're not growing the herbs and vegetables used to make lasagna. That was much to the disappointment of the video crew when we made our video, but it's about layering just like you do lasagna. And here's just a cross section of part of a lasagna garden. So measure out your garden bed. Again, if you have grass, this was in one of my beds that um, had been planted before, but if you had grass or weeds, edge the garden bed so it can't infiltrate from beyond. Um, cut the grass and weeds really short, just leave the clippings in place, cover it with newspaper or cardboard, spread a little compost, keeps it in place and helps start that decomposition because these will break down and add organic matter to the soil. I swear every time I try to use newspaper as a mulch, it gets windy. Even when I make, you know, I usually try to wet it a little bit and spread it. If you have an extra set of hands, even better. So that's my first layer in my lasagna garden. Then I add eight to 10 inches of browns and greens, and I'll talk more about what those are. These are things you throw in the compost pile, but instead you make an eight to 10 inch layer, sprinkle some fertilizer over it, of course, you know, I use malorganite, but that'll help feed the microorganisms because they're going to need some nutrients, some nitrogen as they break down that organic matter. Then we're going to cover that layer with some compost, repeat until the garden bed is 18 to 24 inches tall. Now, you may want to start the garden bed in fall when you have all those resources, you know, the vegetable leaves that weren't good enough for the salad, the fall leaves, landscape trimmings. I made my garden in spring and planted it right away. And I had a great garden that year. Now, if you wanna take it one step further, especially if you have access to logs and branches, try hugel culture. The first layer is branches, twigs, and leaves. Now I garden out, I'm in a pretty open area out in the country. Now I have sandy soil, so it drains fast and a lot of wind. So I made my first layer of my hugel culture garden below ground. I have to be honest, I originally was gonna do four by eight beds, but as we started digging, I decided three by six was enough. Now, if you think about this, the logs, think about when you hike in the woods and a tree falls down and it starts to decay, it absorbs moisture, microorganisms work on breaking it down. It releases nutrients to the surrounding soil. That's the concept here. Now, I have to admit, when I first heard about this, I thought, for years, I've been telling you, don't put wood in the soil because it temporarily ties up the nitrogen. Well, they did research at UW-Madison. A student researched the soil and found it did not have a negative impact on the soil nitrogen. And I found this to be true by experience as well. So your first layer of logs, fill in that voids with twigs and fall leaves, and then you just create your lasagna garden on top of that. When you look on the internet, you'll find pyramid shaped beds. I did more of a traditional rounded bed for mine and it does settle over time, but still three or four years later, it's been since I did my beds, if I walk by and accidentally step in them, you can sink in because the soil is so wonderful. This is what it looked like. I topped it with soil. I planted right away, had a great harvest that first year. This is my friend Stacy and Ken's garden. This is a combination of a keyhole and a uh, hugel culture garden. You can see theirs is a little more raised. Um, this is at the bottom of a hillside. You'll see their prairie garden later. So the water runs down. It's captured by the prairie plants and some other things. But if it does end up in this area, it's captured in that garden bed for the plants to benefit. The other no dig option is cardboard and compost. And there's a link to a gardener in England that's really been promoting this. This was a garden, a therapy garden I did um, with my daughter um, where she was working at the time. So we edged the bed, cut the grass really short, threw down cardboard, and then we ended up using bag material to create it. So the idea here is really you wanna do a five inch layer of compost the first year and you're going to plant your seedlings and transplants in that compost and then eventually the cardboard breaks down but what it does is it suppresses the weeds so you've got quack grass and bindweed and all those things you've got that layer of cardboard that eventually decomposes and then you've got the compost on top to plant directly in then every year you're going to add a couple of inches and for my canadian friends we have the centimeter trans um, 
uh, translation on the handout, and you'll need a couple inches every year. Now, I like this method. I've used cardboard and mulch for mulching the soil, and it works great. My concern is, where do you get the the compost. And here was our garden we planted after. We used a lot of perennials um, just from a maintenance standpoint. And then they had an area where they could meet with clients or just sit and enjoy the space as the staff. And that's our garden right after we planted. But where are you going to get that quality compost? For those of you fighting with jumping worms in your area, those are invasive worms that devour a lot of organic matter and they disrupt the soil texture and the chemistry of the soil and it's hard on our plants. And so it's been challenging to find sources of compost that we know are free of jumping worms, invasive plants, weed seeds and such. So if you're buying in compost, because that's a lot of compost, eight inches deep, if you're buying in compost, ask, how do they manage it? Where do they harvest it? Do they store it where the jumping worms don't have access? Is it, you know, is it composted at a hot enough temperature to kill those things? 104 degrees is what's needed for jumping worms from top to bottom. 160 degrees is more likely what you need for disease organisms, insects, and weed seeds. Um, so just something to keep in mind. So I like that method, and it's just a challenge to find the materials that are free of invasive species. Back in, I think it was the 70s and 80s, Ruth Stout wrote a book the, on deep mulching, and her philosophy was she used to till the garden and she'd prepare the soil, and then she started putting an eight-inch layer of plant material, mostly straw, that she would cover the soil surface. And then she would just pull that back and plant in the soil below. And so the idea, just like mulch, was it's going to suppress weeds, conserve moisture, and as it breaks down, improve the soil. And so that was another no-till method. Um, and I always had concerns about soil temperature being in the north. You know, when you mulch soil, it stays cool longer, especially in the spring. So when I was doing a little bit of writing on the topic and research, um, I found that was a concern. So some of the people doing it found that they had more slug problems, that voles, you know, that created a great environment for that cute little critter right here for voles. And again, at keeping the soil cold. So if you're in the north, you know, one of the things we need is we want our soil to warm as well as the air before we plant tomatoes, peppers, and warm season plants. So you need to find the method that works best for you and your gardening practices and the resources you have available, right? Is it, do you have lots of plant material available that you can use to create your lasagna gardening or plant debris, I should say? Do you have access to straw where you can then just use that as your mulch and do a deep mulch, especially if you're in a warmer climate, that may be a good solution for you. One of the other concerns is if you have lousy soil, poor soil, compacted soil, you may need to do a little amending before you start doing no-till methods, unless you're building on top. With lasagna gardening, you're creating that good planting mix above the soil, the existing soil. And as it decomposes, it improves the soil below. In fact, some of my lasagna beds are quite a few years old and they're even with the surrounding soil. And I still see fewer weeds in those beds and this, the productivity is still great. I need to kind of ref replenish some of them as well. So before you totally translate from maybe lousy soil, compacted soil, poorly drained soil, you may need to assess and say, do I need to amend, add a little compost maybe this first year, and then do some things like cover crops and other no-till. We'll talk about that in a minute. So talked about how we can manage our soil for planting without disturbing it. The other thing we want to do is keep the soil covered year round. So mulch, like you see in this pathway, she's got evergreen needles and maybe some grass clippings in there that she keeps the weeds down and protects the soil. Perennials on either side so that she's also covering the soil so that it's less likely to erode when we get heavy rains it won't it's more resistant to compaction and we'll talk about some of the benefits that plants provide as well you know as the mulch breaks down it's improving the soil so keeping it covered protects the soil and keeps it intact for our plants to grow also having lots of roots in the ground year round is important and 
you know, the more I learn every year about gardening and climate change, the more I realize that I need to fine tune some of my planting strategies. I grow lots of perennials. I love them. They keep the soil covered, but plant roots exude sugars and other uh, materials that feed the soil, feed the microorganisms, and keeping roots in the ground helps prevent erosion. Think about our heavy rains. And even in the winter, when the ground isn't frozen and you've got your plant standing, those roots in the ground, when that top growth slows the water, those roots help allow the water to infiltrate. So the roots are adding things. The old roots, when they die, they add organic matter. So keeping those gardens covered and keeping them in roots as much as possible is important. But we do vegetable gardens and annual flower beds and maybe consider doing cover crops. Minimally maybe mulching, but cover crops. This is buckwheat. And every fall, I'm going to do my cover crop. So I'm committing to all of you, this is the fall. I'm going to get them planted. So cover crops do a couple of things. Some we plant and we leave. We just cut them back and leave them. And some we need to till in, which kind of defeats that whole purpose of, um, you know, keeping minimal till, but they add nitrogen, organic matter to the soil. They keep the soil covered throughout the winter, reducing erosion. Um, some annual crops die back, so you can just cut them down, leave them intact as mulch. So you've got the dead roots in the plants, and that's another way to help improve the soil, keep roots in the ground year round, and then minimize your till. I mentioned it may be hard to find compost, but you can make your own. And you don't need any fancy equipment. You do need some space and you do wanna check with your local municipality. If you're in an urban area, especially some municipalities who have regulations for composting and some even add, um, offer rebates. So you wanna check to make sure that you can compost. It's just about a lot of people in a small area and rodents are an issue, right? And you don't have as many natural predators as those of us in the, in the country. So always check first because you hate to have someone complain. Make it convenient. I love, this was a garden I visited in Virginia, but I love this. Their garden's here so they can put all their garden trimmings in the compost bin next to their shed. And then when the compost is finished, they can add it right back to the planting bin. So it's great. You could do your compost in the sun. It'll heat up faster, but it does dry out quicker. You could put it in the shade, but it's gonna be stay moist longer and it'll stay cooler. So it'll be slower to decompose into finished compost. Bins are basically just to contain and in some places hide your composting process. And so I like these are at Retzer Nature Center. So anybody in the Waukesha County area, check out Retzer. They have a wide display of composters for you to check out. And these we made when I was with the Young Adult Conservation Corps, not this one, but we used this plan and it's basically hardware cloth on a, um, I think those were one, uh, one by four frames and then used eye hooks. And so what you could do is you could open up that compost bin, turn it and then reset, which makes turning a lot easier than putting your fork in, lifting and turning. And we'll talk about turning your compost pile in a minute. Um, I always wanted a three bin composter because here's the benefit. You can stockpile in one. So all your raw material gets thrown into one pile. In the middle, you could then build your pile so it will heat up and decompose efficiently. Uh, efficiently and use the third bin for turning it. So it goes from the second to the third and the third to the second. And that way you're stockpiling separately so you don't slow down the decomposition, the decomposing, the composting process. And then you've got space to turn. So find a bin that works for you if you're looking for a bin. If you know, the idea of turning your compost pile is a little overwhelming. There are tumblers available too. This one's a metal one. It's got aeration. You just give it a twirl and it, it's how you turn your pile. The biggest complaint I get about tumblers is they never seem to fully decompose or turn into compost. And the reason is you're continually adding fresh material. So you may want to get two tumblers or get a dual bin. This is perfect for small areas. And most cities do allow these hard plastic type of tumblers because they tend to be rodent resistant. So on the left, I'm stockpiling my material. 
Once that's filled, then I add um, some fertilizer, moisten it to a consistency of a damp sponge, add a little compost that's got the microorganisms to get it started, and then I start turning. Then I'll stockpile in the other bin. When the one bin is finished, compost complete, I empty it, it's the bin I become, I stockpile and then actively compost the other. So it's just a way of giving you a way to stockpile and a way to actively compost. And this is all you need. You need some landscape trimmings and I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, the, my silver bin is not an ice bucket, but where I keep my compostables in my kitchen, some fertilizer. And then this was my, uh, just my, the bucket, my collapsible bucket for hauling my debris to my compost bin. So what do you use? Nitrogen rich materials. Those are the greens. You often hear equal parts of green and brown help the microbes break it down. That was a chant in the 80s. And I'd get calls about, is this green or is this brown? Bottom line is you can throw material in a heap, let it rot. It'll take longer if you don't kind of put greens and browns together, but you will eventually get compost. So greens are high in nitrogen, things like manure, vegetable clippings, those greens, fruit and vegetable, kitchen scraps, plant scraps, herbicide-free grass clippings. So if you do a weed and feed on your lawn, you don't want to collect those clippings, leave them there. If you live near a lake, seaweed and kelp. The browns are carbon rich, and that's things like coffee grounds, evergreen needles, corn stalks and corn cobs, the leaf, fall leaves, non-glossy paper and cardboard. So if we have nitrogen and carbon in um, a balanced situation, it's going to decompose more rapidly. But bottom line is if you throw it together, it's going to work. One caution about coffee grounds, they really found coffee grounds are great, but more than 20% in your compost pile can interfere. Coffee grounds can be allelopathic, meaning they can be toxic to certain plants, prevent some seeds from sprouting. So if you compost them, it's perfect. Just don't overdo whether you use them as a top dress in your garden or you throw them in the compost pile. These are the things you don't add. You don't want to add bones, meat, fish, fat, and dairy because those will bring in the rodents. This is all about plant material. Disease and insect infected, disease and insect infested plant material because most of us don't heat our compost, make our compost actively enough that it heats high enough. Remember I mentioned that 160 degrees minimum to kill those things. Perennial and invasive weeds. If you throw quack grass in your compost pile, you're probably going to be planting it again when you put the finished uh, compost on the garden. A friend of mine always said, he, he taught me a lot about composting. He used to say, if you have quack grass, burn it and spread the ashes on cement. He was kidding, but if you've been battling quackgrass or for me, field bindweed too, you can think hmm, maybe not such a bad idea. Don't do that. Um, but you do, what I do with mine is I'll throw them in a clear plastic bag and solarize it before I throw it in the compost pile. Invasive weeds, most municipalities let you bag and throw them out. I'll show that in a minute. Weeds that have gone to seed, even flowers, things like garlic mustard, we found once they start blooming, if you throw them in and, and, and those flowers will develop into seeds, so then you'll have more garlic mustard to pull. No charcoal ashes, and again, grass clippings from a treated lawn. Don't include those in the compost pile. So what do you do with problem debris? Well, a couple things. If you're actively composting, you're probably okay to add certain things. Some material can be buried if you have room, and some municipalities let you throw these in the landfill. Um, if you are taking them to the compost, the city recycling, think about how you're impacting others who might be taking the finished product. There's a community south of Milwaukee that does an amazing composting job. They um, compost in those big white tubes that you see um, farmers put their straw in, their round bales of straw. They put all their yard waste in, they inject fertilizer, they aerate, and what comes out is an amazing product and it heats up nicely. Not all municipal, more and more municipalities are trying to manage their plant waste and yard waste in a very responsible manner, but a lot of times the volume is so big it's hard to get those temperatures high enough.
Um, I mentioned invasive plants. Um, a lot of municipalities let you bag it. Some like you to mark the clear plastic bag and throw it in the landfill so it's buried and it's not a problem in the compost. So how do you build your compost pile? Just a reminder, if you throw your material in a heap, it will eventually decompose. And what I did when I was in the city and I didn't always get mine turned, I just harvest the finished product from the bottom and kept adding to the top, but it took longer. You may want to put twigs and branches at the bottom, or some people compost on a pallet that's been covered with hardware cloth. That allows aeration underneath. So having air around and under your compost pile is great. It speeds that decomposition. So that's an optional thing. Then you're going to create a layered pile. So your first layer, just like we did for the lasagna garden, is eight to 10 inches of green and brown debris. Cover it with compost, add a little fertilizer, and that's going to feed those microorganisms and continue the process. One of the things I do is I use organic planting mixes. And so at the end of the season, my annual pots, or if I'm changing out a perennial container, I'll dump that in my compost pile. So that's got some organic matter. And my potting mix contains compost. So I feel like that helps inoculate the pile way of getting a second use out of that potting mix before it goes back in the garden. So we've built our pile at least three feet high and three feet wide. Minimum if you want to maximize decomposition. Then we're going to moisten it to a consistency of a damp sponge, a sponge that's been wrung out. Too wet, the microorganisms aren't effective. Too dry, they're not active. So we like it moist. So if you're in an area where it's hot and dry, you don't get regular rainfall, you might want to put your compost pile where water is accessible. If you're in a rainy area, I know some parts of the country, people will cover their compost piles when it gets into their rainy period so it doesn't get wet. Think of a bag of grass clippings or a pile of debris that's wet and it's been wet and it does stink. That's anaerobic decomposition because there's no room for the air. It's all moisture. It eventually breaks down, but it stinks and usually gets a high level of ammonia. So you want to avoid that. If you get your pile too wet, whether it's the weather or you accidentally overwatering it, just add some dry material or give it a turn to help it dry out. Then we're going to turn that compost pile. So after a few days, that middle part of your compost pile, it will heat up, hopefully, if you've built it three by three and use greens and browns, it should heat up pretty high in a couple of days. There are compost thermometers. They have a long probe on that you can stick in the middle of the compost pile to measure the temperature. As those temperatures drop, then you're going to take the material from the center that was the hottest and it's going to be the most decomposed, put it on the outside. The material on the outside where it was cooler goes in the center and we're turning it to kind of get that warmth going throughout an even decomposition in the pile or somewhat even. And your compost is usually ready in six to 12 months. Keep in mind, the more you, the more action you put in, the more effort you put in to the composting, the quicker you get results. Then rain. So we've dealt with our yard waste and then we've improved our gardens by putting it and turning it into compost. But what about all that water, those heavy rain periods? How can we manage that? You can collect 623 gallons of water from a one inch rainfall over a thousand square feet of roof. That's a lot of water. And if we can keep water on our property, our plants benefit, it reduces the risk of stormwater overflows and allows us to collect it and put it to use. Um, so a couple things about rain barrels. This gardener made it into a work of art, elevated it because gravity is how that water is emptied out. And this also allows access for your, um, contain your um, watering can as well or hooking up a hose to remove the water. You want that spigot low on the barrel so you don't have a lot of stagnating water. You can see there's an opening for the downspout to enter. You want a screen on the top or just a very narrow opening to help keep debris out. Um, and also insects. Mosquitoes, um, if you're worried about that, throw a mosquito dunk. It's an organic product that gives you 30 days when the 
mosquitoes, if they lay eggs in your rain barrel, the eggs hatch, the larva ingests the mosquito dunk uh, treated water and they die. It's safe for birds, wildlife and such. An overflow. So remember that 50 gallon rain barrel is gonna overflow pretty quickly in a heavy rainstorm. So an area for it to go out, just like your downspout used to, some people use a downspout diverter. So they just use that diverter to divert water from their downspout to the rain barrel. When the rain barrel is full, it closes and the water continues as it did in the past in the downspout. You may want to use those overflows to interconnect your rain barrel. So one fills up, it goes to the second, the third, and the fourth. And that's a way to collect more rain water so that you have it to use during dry periods. Um, Kelly, if you're watching, I told you, so this is Kelly's yard. I saw her garden on a tour of Wauwatosa and I loved what she did. She's collecting water off her garage. She has a small city lot. And what do you do between the garage and the fence? Well, how about use that for her rain barrel? So they're interconnected. She can harvest water from either end. She's training it down. So they overflow from the roof of the garage and overflow. I just like this idea for a couple reasons. Small space gardeners, you have a challenge. Where are you going to put that rain barrel? So it's an added benefit to your landscape. Um, how can you maximize water collection? When I lived in the city, my neighbor's house was eight feet away from me. So if she put her water into my yard, it'd be going in my basement and vice versa. I had nothing but plants, you'll see later, but I also had a county easement that I could put some of my water there. But rain barrels allow you to collect the water. Again, check with your municipality. I know there are some places, uh, especially in areas with limited rainfall that have restrictions on using rain barrels and other municipalities provide rebates. So you might wanna check that out. If you're disconnecting, um, this is my friend Mark. We did a video on disconnecting. So this is Dawn's house. She let us disconnect. Um, so she had uh, her downspout went to the storm uh, sewer directly. And some municipalities are trying to avoid overflows by disconnecting. So we had to block that um, inlet where the downspout was leading down to the combined sewer system out into the storms, the stormwater and the sewer combined. So we disconnected, but we had to cover it so no rodents could get there. Uh, Mark put a div, uh, extension to go into the rain barrel. And then in the fall, she had to close things off, take that off, empty the rain barrel, because we live in the north, uh, either turn it upside down, store it in the garage, and then reconnect the downspout so the water would go away from the house. Um, I wanna thank Dawn for sharing. She was on vacation in New Orleans and saw this beautiful, uh, beautiful, um, uh, wonderful rain barrel. It's a work of art that matched the work of art along the bottom of the building. How cool is that? So whether you're an artist or not, you might find ways of making it a plus in your landscape. Maybe you're going to mask it with plantings. You know, we found a place to put our garbage cans. Our rain barrels are going to be close to our house, but maybe some decorative fencing. Make sure it's accessible, though. This is a rain, um, kind of a rain garden, uh, rain barrel combination. It's a product called Storm Garden. Check out their website. But it's a, a, a engineer in Milwaukee. She designed this. So it collects, I think, three or three to five times more water than one rain barrel. And then the top, so you can see the downspouts directed to these stones. Then the water that slows the water, it infiltrates. So she's got this a planting area. So they benefit from the water. The excess goes into the collection collection basin, and then there's overflows that go into the yard if it becomes filled. But it allows a very beautiful, it's like a raised bed garden that functions to collect water, grow plants, attractive, and takes up minimal space. But what about using that water? Um, Rutgers University, and I put a link to that, uh, one of their web pages, um, they did some research and they were looking at bacteria, uh, you know, birds are up on your roof. What are they doing up there? Probably pooping. You've got the shingles. What are they releasing chemical-wise? What they found is that the bacterial levels weren't 
that met the federal standards, but they recommend that you test your water before you put it on edible plants. Otherwise, use it on your ornamental gardens. Soil and plant roots are great filters. And so by putting that on your ornamental plants and your containers, when it's going down into through the soil and the plant roots, it removes some of those, filters out some of those impurities. So check that out. That's some good information, some links to some other things that will be helpful. Fresh Coast Guardians, I also have a link to their website. Fresh Coast Guardians has a great video on how to install a rain barrel. And they also have tips on storing it as well. But this is just one thing you can do. And what I'd recommend is disconnect one downspout at a time. See how you can manage that. This was my house in the city, which you could tell I needed to deal with the leaf debris. But I put my rain barrel, I just had the I had a very steep garage roof. It went down into that rain barrel. I then could use it to water all my ornamental plants that hit it. So I could kind of move my bird bath, sneak in, get the water, and then uh, water my nearby planters. So it's a great way of putting it to use safely. Rain gardens. I recently did a webinar uh, with sponsored by Fresh Coast Guardians, Milwaukee Metro Sewage District, and the libraries hosted. It's on their YouTube channel on rain gardens. So I'm just going to give you a brief overview because we have a lot to cover. Rain gardens are designed to capture runoff from your roof and hard surface and your lawn, intercept it before it reaches the street. Those plant roots filter the impurities before the water goes to the groundwater. Plan for success so that you can minimize maintenance. And that's really important. I've seen a lot of rain gardens that were taken over by one vigorous plant or people were frustrated because they plant, planted small transplants and they weren't flowering right away. It takes a couple of years for those perennials to reach maturity and start blooming. So plan accordingly. The Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources has an excellent step-by-step -step guide for homeowners and landscapers. It's free to download. Uh, there's a link in your handout and it's got great information to help you plan a rain garden. And take into account your soil type, the the distance from your house, the size of your landscape, and how big an area you're trying to collect the water from. Keep the garden, if possible, at least 10 feet away. Nobody needs more water by the foundation. Less than 30 feet away, because the further from your house, the more water it picks up on the lawn, and then the more water, the bigger garden you'll need to handle that. Again, consider one downspout at a time and do multiple beds so that you can figure out how much you can really manage. Manage. You want it on a gentle slope, but not a steep slope. The steeper the slope, the deeper you dig. If you look here, they put two stakes at the top and at the bottom of where the rain garden's going to pull the string, leveled it out. And then you've got to dig because you want the garden level so it collects the water. And then you put a berm on the end so that water slowly overflows or doesn't is trapped. Now, this is not a water feature. This should drain within 24, no more than 48 hours. Okay, so we're going to dig. We're going to amend the soil so it drains well. We're going to amend the soil so it holds moisture during dry periods. Direct the water to the garden. How do you do that? Well, you may just do a gravel swale like they did here. This was a rain garden I installed. You can see the downspout. I think the mowing crew took it down. So we had to put it at a low spot, put it about, I think that was about 5, 10, 15 feet from the building. Um, Doug, it was a lot of work. Then we put a um, drain pipe uh, that had holes in it, a flexible PVC drain pipe just one of those drain pipes to get the water from the downspout, which we reconnected to the garden. And then we just put the sod back over. We cut the sod out, put it back over, try to get that water directed to the middle of the garden bed. Um, gravel at the base, so when the water comes rushing out in a heavy rain, the soil doesn't erode, and an animal guard. The last thing you want is a dead something in your um, drain tile or your downspout that blocks the flow of water. 
Uh, this is a small space gardener. That's a pipe from their uh, their sump pump going to their rain garden. That's their garage. So it's on a slab, not a basement. This is Retzer Nature Center. When they put their extension in, they ran, they built those arbors, ran their gutters. So the gutters went into the arbor, directed water down the rain chain, hit that stone. So it slowed the velocity into the rain garden. I just think this is an idea we could use the arbor and the gutter method in home situations. And then pick plants that will tolerate extremes. On the left, we have joe pie weed, perfect for those moist conditions, that wetter part of your rain garden. Agastache, anise hyssop that will tolerate it a little dry. So on the edge of your rain garden, make sure it complements your landscape. And then maybe you don't have room for that. How about a dry riverbed? This is North Wind Perennials and they put in a dry riverbed to handle times when there's rain and times when it's dry. So they didn't have to function putting water in. This is next to my garage. I have sandy soil, but I have a downspout. Most of the time the water infiltrates, but every once in a while, especially in winter, I get some runoff into the sidewalk. So we dug a trench, my grandson and I, lined it with landscape fabric so that the rocks would stay above, filled it with rock, and then I put a rain chain in and a device to capture and slow the water down. And that was my dry river bed in amongst my planting. And this is at We Energy Energy Park at Wisconsin State Fair. They wanted a path because the grass kept getting beaten down during fair. And the contractors, Wisconsin Landscape Contractors Association, Milwaukee Metro Traffic, chapter installed permeable pavers. Grow plants that make a difference. So let's talk about those. A diversity of plants. We all probably have heard of Dutch elm disease, emerald ash borer. When we have a monoculture and a disease or an insect pest move in, it can wipe out the garden. Also, different plant roots put in different um, chemicals into the soil to improve it. And so it's helping build our soil. It helps to support the microorganisms. Better soil, better plants. And then plants that tolerate extremes. So swamp milkweed, also called red milkweed, will take moist to wet conditions, but also will tolerate it dry and is pretty hardy. Nine bark is a shrub that takes it hot and dry and is hardy in a wide range of growing conditions. Native plants when appropriate. And this means not, Evelyn Howe had a great, uh, had a great analogy. She said, we take a thousand acre ecosystem, a prairie, and try to put it on a quarter acre city lot and expect it to act the same. So if you look at a prairie, you'll have large pieces of cone flower, large expanses of rudbeckia and certain grasses, but there's a thousand acres for them to kind of find their way together. And when we put it in a smaller area, we have to choose wisely for a couple reasons. One, our soil isn't the same as in our native areas, you may not have as much space. So if you get something like cup plant, which is a great bird plant, but it will eat your landscape. So picking the right native plant for the growing conditions, light and soil and the available space is very important. Now, why do we like native plants? They've evolved with insects and wildlife. So it's their preferred food. They also have deep root systems. So they help break up heavy clay soil, they create pathways for storm water to go down. When the old roots die, they add organic matter. So they are a good choice if they will fit the space when mature and if they'll tolerate the growing conditions. This is Stacy. I showed you her Hugel culture garden. They have a steep hillside, they have space. And it did take them a few years to establish their prairie, but when the water runs down the hill, all these plants slow down the velocity. They help capture it so it goes down into the soil and eventually the groundwater instead of their basement. But maybe you don't have that much space. This is Patricia Hill. She wrote a book, Native Plants for Your Garden or Landscape. I think it's out of print. But she had a small city lot. This is in Northern Illinois. And what was cool is when we were looking for her house, we saw all her neighbors scattered around that also kind of started doing the same thing. So maybe you convert your yard to all gardens. And even with a small space, a few native plants that are appropriate mixed in with even your cultivated plants might be an option for you. 
plant trees if you have space. We all learned at Arbor Day celebrations, trees help remove pollutants. They add oxygen to the air. They are carbon sinks. So when we cut down and remove trees, we're removing all that carbon and releasing some of it back into the air as CO2. They also, though, help manage storm water. Think about trees, uh, street trees, and what shade they provide, how I had a street tree in my city lot. I did not have air conditioning. And if that what tree on the west side of my house were to die, boy, I would not have been able to stand it in my house in the summer. It shaded my home. So trees provide shade. They, are core, they store carbon and they help manage storm water and just make our environment better uh, for a lot of reasons. So Here's how trees help manage storm water. When water falls, it slows the velocity. Some of it's captured in the canopy and evaporates back into the atmosphere. Some of it goes all the way down. Some follows the trunk and branches, again, going slower. So then it goes down to the ground. The tree roots, the leaf litter, the ground cover underneath the tree protect the soil allow that rainfall to go infiltrate the soil. Some's absorbed by the roots of the trees, goes through the trees and is transpired, sweats out the leaves and back in the atmosphere. So it really is a great, it's great. And I put a link to a blog that I did for Melorganite on how trees help us manage stormwater. Pretty interesting what goes on. We sometimes, you know, take for granted, especially if you've grown up with a city with lots of street trees or trees in your house uh, and your yard as well. Um, plant tree shrubs and ground covers to not only protect the soil to store carbon, but to cool your house. Bare soil is much hotter than, than soil covered, even with grass or ground covers or shaded by shrubs. You can cool the environment by your house. You know the difference, right? On a hot day, you stand on a parking lot on the asphalt, that's pretty hot. You stand in bare soil, it's pretty warm. You go into an area covered with ground cover or shaded by trees or shrubs, much cooler. You can feel the difference. And I'm gonna talk a lot about energy conservation in the fall webinar. It's a great time to plant trees and shrubs. We've been through the summer. You know where some of the issues are. So I hope you can join me for that or watch the recording later. Grow some of your own food. The average miles that food goes from grower to your grocery store and then your house is 1,500. That's a lot of gas. That's a lot of fuel to transport, a lot of fuel to package. And the flavor and nutritional value is much less. So anytime we can grow our own food, better flavor, more nutritional value, we're reducing the use of fossil fuels or buy locally. A lot of communities now have farmer's markets. So you're supporting the local farmers and you're getting good food. Even if you don't have a lot of space, that was Dawn's garden in her backyard, but you can grow things in containers. You know, on the left, this was at Epcot and they had Swiss chard, parsley, cabbage. Um, this was a tomato planter in my patio. Um, there's lots of new compact varieties, perfect for containers. And then I use strawberries cascading. So I had a few fresh strawberries and tomatoes I could pick. And then on the right, this was at Epcot as well. And they used a layer planting to pack a lot of food and beauty in in there. Um, lettuce, greens, uh, very economical to grow your own. You'll get the best flavor if it's easy and convenient. Here's some kale, I think very pretty and very nutritious in a raised bed planter so the rabbits can't get at it, easy to harvest. You're limited on space when I lived in the city and I even do this now, I like to mix flowers with my vegetables. I like it to be pretty as well as edible. This is um, the herb garden at Burner Botanical Gardens, the gardens at Whitnall Park. Keep out invasive plants. This is Dame's Rocket. And I picked this one because it's a plant that grows along the woodland's edge. And a lot of people think it's woodland phlox, but it's not. Notice there are four petals. That tells you it's in the mustard family. Woodland phlox has five petals like other phlox. This is often included in wildflower mixes. Um, I've, I don't think as much anymore, but definitely 20 or 30 years ago, I would see this in wildflower mixes. It is not native to North America, it's native to Europe. It has fragrant flowers, it's pretty, and it spreads like crazy. I stopped along a parkway and you can see it's infiltrated the woodland. And so we wanna 
avoid planting them. You know, some plants like this one, people inadvertently bought because it was in the wildflower mix. Or you may have bought buckthorn or honeysuckle because they were low maintenance plants. Then we find out they're invasive and we now need to get rid of them. So always check with your local Department of Natural Resources for the list of prohibited and restricted plants. Your extension service should tell you which ones in your area are allowed or not. And the same with nature center. So it's a lot of good information. Always check invasives.org is what I go to to see where plants are invasive because I'm lucky enough to work with gardeners all over North America. How do they have an impact on climate change? This was some interesting um, information and there's a link in your handout to some more of it, but they disrupt the ecosystem. And so what happens is they disrupt the ecosystem, the hydrology of the soil, so we see more wildfires. So obviously, you know the negative impact on the environment. Plants, this is purple loosestrife growing along shorelines, wetlands, and waterways, impact the hydrology. So with drought, many of our streams um, have a low water level. These end up interfering with the flow. So it just interferes with um, the habitat, the water uh, quality, and the hydrology, how that water impacts the wildlife and how it cycles through. And, and then um, the, the, sorry, invasive plants in forest impact tree and shrub growth. Remember, they're carbon sinks. And so that releases more CO2 as those plants are crowded out and die. So keeping invasive out, we don't want them in our garden anyway. They disrupt, they may, you know, in, in invade and take over our gardens. I'm talking invasive, not aggressive plants. Invasive plants are those that are bullies, but they leave our landscape and they invade our natural spaces. Aggressive plants are bullies that just kind of eat their way over your garden and take over any timid neighbors. Now you probably don't want those either because it's more work for you, but invasive plants are those that leave our landscape and invade our natural spaces, disrupt the habitat, um, impact our native plants that wildlife, birds, beneficial insects depend upon. It also impacts our health. So this is um, honeysuckle, some of the Japanese honeysuckles and buckthorn and barberry have become invasive. And they did some research and found honeysuckle and barberry infested woods provide a great habitat for ticks, they like that high humidity, the deer walk by, the ticks grab onto them, then the deer come and munch in your landscape, the ticks drop off, you get infected. When they tested the ticks in invasive plant infested woods, they had 10 times the amount of infection um, human bacterial disease causing infection than in areas that didn't have invasive plants. So it's good for our health as well. Okay, last but not least, lawns. We often overlook lawns and say lawn, sustainable, climate friendly. This was my house in Milwaukee. And um, when we bought the house, there were a row of ewes right up against the house and short grass. Over time, we killed got rid of the grass and replaced it with garden. I have to say, initially my neighbors kind of thought I was crazy. This was back in the 80s. Um, eventually though, I even had kids go by on their bikes going, hey, nice garden lady. I'm sure some people didn't get it, but I got rid of most of my lawn just a few areas around the bed by the street where the de-icing salt would hit it. And just to show this was a planned garden. So these plants absorbed more moisture, helped keep my house cooler because of the shade it provided. The ground covers kept it cooler. That was my option. It was a small city lot and that was my option. But maybe you wanna have some grass-like areas. On the left of your screen is a no mow lawn, fine fescues, and they're great if you wanna develop a bee lawn, a lawn that is very supportive to bees. And most of the bees attracted to the clover and the violets are not the stinging type. But again, you need to decide. No mow lawns, um, that may be your option that and nothing else, uh, you can allow to grow and not mow and look meadow-like. Um, you can mow them maybe once a month, so you're using less 
power equipment or less work pushing, um, or you can mow them regularly. And then the idea here is you mow high, so things like violet and clover, clover fixes nitrogen, puts it back in the lawn. In fact, it was included in lawn seed mixes for many years because it was a nurse crop. It captured nitrogen from the atmosphere, added it to the soil with a relationship it had with uh, a soil organism, and then that fed the lawn. So if your lawn has a lot of clover, it may be under fertilized, but maybe that's okay. The clover's doing the job. And violets are great for pollinators. I know not everybody likes them. So you have to decide what kind of lawn you want and the impact it will have in your landscape. So let's say you want a more traditional lawn. Here are some things you can do. Mow high so that you're encouraging good deep roots that can absorb the water from a larger area. Leave your grass clippings. They add nutrients, organic matter back to the soil. So if you leave a season's worth of grass clippings on your lawn, especially when they're short, they break down in just a couple of days, it's equal to one fertilization. So cutting the grass, fertilizing the soil, improving it. So those are some things you can do. The other thing is to top dress with compost, as I mentioned before, a quarter inch of compost applied twice a year, I forget what university did the research found that was that was usually enough compost and enough nutrients for you to keep your lawn healthy. The other thing is deciding if you want to let it go dry during dry periods. Now, in the Midwest and upper Midwest, usually our dry periods are six or eight weeks, and most lawns will recover from that. Yes, you'll have more weeds, but you won't be watering it. Um, if you do decide to water, wait until you leave footprints in the lawn and then water. If you let it go dormant and it's an extended dry period, a quarter inch of water will keep the crowns from dying back. Look for more drought tolerant grasses. If you're down south, Ladybird Johnson, um, the wildflower, um, her uh, gardens, the wildflower gardens, they used habit habit turf and it was a drought and heat tolerant turf that could go dormant during extreme heat but recover. Uh, tall fescue is more heat and drought tolerant and some gardens, some uh, gardeners are using it in California. You want the rhizomaceous, it means it spreads more like bluegrass or fescue. Um, so if you are going to have lawn, you need to think about how you manage the water. As I mentioned, leave your grass clippings. In the fall, leave the leaves. Just take your mower over. When you're cutting the grass, you'll shred the leaves. As long as they're the size of a quarter or smaller, they won't cover your lawn grass. They won't cause disease and insect problems. They'll break down, add organic matter and nutrients to the soil. And then I mentioned top dressing. Twice a year, if you can, with a quarter inch, those compost spreaders that are hand pushed will make the job a lot easier. Um, and then try to use push mowers and um, electric equipment. And I know I need to clean my the bottom of my mower, my apologies. Um, but make sure your blade is sharp. Make sure the, your equipment is serviced, it's running efficiently. But they found if you have sharp blades, you reduce the use of fuel by 22%. You'll use less fuel. You'll mow faster because those sharp blades cut through. Your lawn will use up to 30% less water because you'll make a clean cut on the grass that closes quickly so the plant doesn't lose as much moisture. So have a couple sets of mower blades. Make sure they're sharp. So change them out as needed. We have lots of rocks in our property. So we're changing our mower blades a couple of times a season. And then I mentioned push mowers. They're more available now. Electric mowers. We have a, a solar panels on our golf cart and an inverter so I can run my mower, recharge my batteries via solar power, and I can usually get the small areas where I use my push mower um, that's electric cut in the time it takes me to use that battery. And then last but not least, manage pests. Look for ways to manage those insects in an environmentally friendly way. Most insects are good guys. They're pollinators, they're decomposers. You know, ground beetles help break down organic matter and improve the soil. Work with nature. Here, lady beetles, that's a lady beetle larva eats the 
aphids. They can eat up to 500 aphids. So that means you need to tolerate some damage. Wait for the good guys to come in to eat the bad guys. Because if you kill the bad guys right away, the good guys are going elsewhere to feed. These are green, green laceworms. That's the larva. Sometimes they called an aphid lion on the bottom. And they lay their eggs on these little spindles because... <laughs> They're cannibalistic. So when that egg hatches, they got to run and quick make it escape before their fellow green lace wings eat them. But they eat a lot of aphids as well. Parasitic wasp, if you see um, that uh, hornworm with all those larvae on it, what happened is the parasitic wasp lays its eggs in the caterpillar. The eggs um, hatch, the larvae eat the insides of the caterpillar. They pupate, those are their cocoons, and then they'll hatch and more parasitic wasp will hatch and go take care of more caterpillars for you. And then plant things that attract beneficial insects. You're probably already doing it. Sweet alyssum, um, a fragrant annual that brings in many beneficial insects. Lots of herbs like dill. Will any of those members of the umbel, umbelaceae family will bring in a lot of beneficial insects. Things like goldenrod not only help our pollinators, but bring in the good guys. You probably would be amazed to find the flies, the beetles, the parasitic wasp, the uh, obviously bumblebees and things that are attracted to your flowers. If you're kind to your environment and you skip the pesticide, or if you decide you have to step in, use an eco-friendly one and spot treat only, then you'll get the toads and the frogs moving in and they eat a variety of insects. Just an old flower pot underneath a shrub or amongst the perennials, leave an opening for them to go in. They hide out in cool, damp places. They like to be amongst plants because they eat a lot of insects for you. Songbirds are excellent, including hummingbirds. This is on my, this is a hummingbird that visits my yard and he'll also feed on my hummingbird feeder, my lilac flowers, my honeysuckle vine, but I'll see him sitting on my lilac eating insects and then he'll come and take a sip of nectar and you'll see songbirds eating insects like 86% of songbirds eat insects. So if nature isn't doing the job, you might try barriers. This is floating row cover. Let's air lot and water through, but it traps heat around so it can jumpstart the season, but it won't let things like cabbage worms and Japanese beetles and bean beetles get to your plants, lay their eggs and cause damage. Now things that need pollinating like squash and melons, cover them up early in the season. As soon as they start flowering, you'll need to remove the barrier so the pollinators can get the flowers. But research found that reduced the risk of squash, squash vine borer and squash bugs by covering them at planting, removing as they flowered. And then traps, of course, stale beer and a shallow container. On the right is a pretty slug trap. It looks like a mushroom. The slugs crawl in, they die a happy death and takes care of the problem for you. And then there's also the hand picking, the physical method. Hamilton uh, Botanic Gardens or the Royal Botanic Gardens in Hamilton, Canada, I visited their children's garden. They had the pluck, drop and stomp method. They taught the, taught the kids, the good guys from the bad guys. They'd pluck them off the plants, drop them, and stomp on them. And what a great way to burn up energy. Maybe a friend of mine had kids in the neighborhood use badminton rackets to knock down the cabbage moths, and he'd pay them a penny a piece. I think inflation has hit that too. But it might be a way to enlist help and teach kids the good guys from the bad guys. And sanitation, Botrytis and Phytophthora blight. So those flower buds of that peony are never going to open. they are um, been attacked by Botrytis blight. Remove those, throw them in the garbage right away to get that disease out. In the fall, cut your peony back. Get rid of that debris. This is one to bury or, if you can, throw it in the garbage. And farmers have been rotating crops, gardeners have been as well. And if you're planting annual gardens, try to do different flowers. Those impatients look great, but maybe switch them out with a shade tolerant coleus or a begonia so that you're putting different chemicals that the microorganisms appreciate in the soil and you reduce the risk of disease. And when you're rotating, rotate out a family. So don't follow tomatoes with peppers, they're related. Follow tomatoes with beans, beans with broccoli, broccoli with 
onions. If you can do that, you'll improve the soil and you'll reduce the risk of disease and insect problems. Last but not least, always contact 811 it's a number throughout Canada and the United States or in Wisconsin, diggershotline.com, or there is a link also to those of you in other states where you can file online. It's about avoiding damage to the underground utilities, keeping you safe. You hit a utility line, it can be a risk to your health and even your survival. Inconvenience, you hit the the cable line, no one's going to like you, and it'll save you money because if you don't have the market and you hit an underground utility, you pay for the repair. It's a free service. Three business days before you start digging, contact them. They'll send the utility companies out to mark the location in your work area. It's good for you. And this this is a great graphic because it shows you, even though it's supposed to be two feet deep, that soil can settle over time. I have a, a drive next to a farm field and we had the gas line marked and, you know, it just happens. They plow out a wider and wider and we just met to just great guy just saying, hey, we need you away from those gas lines for your safety. Um, please join me. Again, I mentioned the fall webinar on landscaping for energy conservation. We all want to reduce our energy costs. Um, if you haven't done a seed swap, there's still time. Somebody, a friend of mine gave me some basil seeds. He had extra. I gave him some tomato seeds. June, I'm going to have a video and a handout on how to grow a tomato in a pot. So there's always room for a tomato, even if it's on your balcony or your front steps or back steps. Um, in July, go on a bug hunt. Um, we've got a beautiful um, bug hunt journal that you can keep as a family. Um, Dawn just updated it and posted it on our website. And then I did a video with my grandkids to help give you some ideas on how to do a bug hunt. In fact, in March one day, they all said, let's go on a bug hunt, Grandma. I was babysitting. We didn't find a lot, but it got them outside and it got them looking. And then we'll do some worm composting in August, a great way to repurpose those kitchen scraps into fertilizer. Stay connected. There's connections on my handout. Please be patient. Um, I try to get to questions as quickly as possible. And I know I owe some of you. Last but not least, help me grow a gardener or two. This is my grandson, Sammy, a couple years ago. He helped me. He's a great digger. He loves to dig. So I put that skill to use. He helped me dig that uh, dry river bed and make it. And so that was a great opportunity for us to do on a project together. Of course, he earned some money, which was his motivation, but it put his skills to work. Whoever inspired you, thank them and do the same for someone else, whether it's a grandchild, a nephew, a niece, a the kids down the block. Uh, I know gardeners that help the neighborhood kids because their parents are so busy, plant a garden or harvest some things. Maybe it's a young family growing their garden for the first time, or a new retiree. I've met a few this year. Um, there were 18 million new gardeners in COVID. Most are planning on continuing to garden. So if you're experienced, share your wisdom with others. If you're new, welcome. We're glad to have you. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Again, thanks to We Energies for sponsoring this webinar and the whole library program. And also thanks to Milwaukee Public Library for hosting this webinar. Kelly and her team give up evening so we can do this for you. And the public libraries across Wisconsin and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan who are helping us get the word out about growing climate-friendly, bountiful, budget-wise gardens, whether it's food you're growing, a landscape, how we as gardeners can make a difference, make our gardens better, help the environment, and save money as well. I want to thank you guys. I Oh, I was trying to get done in an hour and there's always too much, but I'll be glad to answer your questions. And if we run out of time, info at melindamyers.com. Give me a few days and I'll get back to you. Thanks so much, Melinda. And I mean, I know we talked a little bit before the webinar, but like, there's just so much to cover. I feel like it's impossible to do that in an hour. So um, thank you for being patient <laughs> and forgiving. <laughs> okay. Let's get to our questions here. So, um, I know uh, Amy shared this, I think before you got to this in the presentation, I don't know if this was okay. answered or not, but um, Amy's asking, we noticed that coffee grounds were listed as a brown, but shouldn't they be a green for composting? Um, they're really a carbon rich product. So they go into the compost pile. So you put, com you put 
greens and browns into your compost pile. They, um, so they tend to have a higher carbon rate. And that's one reason you need to be careful about how you add them to your garden soil as well. Um, and so compost is made of nitrogen rich as well as carbon rich. And that's why we put them together and no more than 20% going into the compost piles recommended just so that you get that equal balance. And again, um, put it all together. I. I honestly, I just throw what I have together. I try to be aware if my compost isn't working, I look at, okay, do I need to add some more nitrogen rich products or do I need more carbon? Do I need to put a little fertilizer in there to feed the microorganisms while they break down and they'll end up releasing more nutrients um, when they're, by the time they're done decomposing. So um, I think it, Washington State University has a good, some good information on coffee grounds and how to use them and how much and how little you should put in the soil. So it's a great, it's a great way. And I used to throw my coffee filters. I get unbleached coffee filters and throw those in my compost as well. Good question. Our next question comes from Nancy. Nancy asks, how hot does the bark need to be to kill off jumping worms? Um, well, a hundred and four degrees is what the research has shown. So, but that's all the way through. So if you're making your own compost, that's one of the things you'll wanna check the temperature. And that's where that long probe comes in handy. Um, if, you know, if you've got perennial gardens, you're kind of out of luck, right? Because you're not gonna cover the garden and cook because you'll cook the plants. Um, if you're doing annual gardens and you have jumping worms, the problem is you could kill them in that bed, but they're gonna come in from the outside area. UW Madison Arboretum, Brad Herrick. If you type in UW Madison Arboretum jumping worm YouTube, he has a great webinar, it, no solutions. They haven't found a cure yet, but he talks about jumping worms in even earthworms in the upper Midwestern issue in the Northeast because they aren't native and people threw them, they're fishing bait in the woods and they eat organic matter and that disrupts the soil ecology. But jumping worms are, they can spread like 17 acres in a season. And so they're voracious and they're really, disrupting uh, plant growth. And he's doing some research on plants that are tolerating jumping worm invaded soil as well. Don't trade plants if you have jumping worms and maybe don't accept plants in case somebody goes, huh, jumping worms. Um, ask your people you're buying your mulch and your compost from how they manage it. And if they say what, jumping worms, you may wanna look elsewhere. I'm finding very limited sources. Um, I found one gentleman, he donates mulch to our gardens at State Fair and it's triple, um, it's triple ground and composted. The temperatures get really hot. We have not found any jumping worms from that mulch. Um, he only unfortunately sells to landscapers, but I think more, and I keep telling him he needs to make it available to gardens, but I, gardeners, but I think the more gardeners ask about jumping worms, the more we're going to find companies being responsive. I know Sue HSU, who does a organic potting mix and leaf compost is developed a system that people, companies, garden centers can ask for custom bag product where they uh, store their product and, and deal with it to create it so they kill any jumping worm issues and store it so jumping worms aren't reinvading. So you might, if you're in the Midwest, I know they have some limited distribution, you might wanna check that out, but ask those questions. I think we're gonna get, you know, anytime we ask, we can, and they know people will spend the money and buy it, that it's a difference. Um, we'll get people making those changes for us, I think. Yeah, I feel like that, um, I've seen that with native plant availability too. Good point. At stores, so it's a great, great tip. Let's see. Oh, just a reminder to everyone too, um, I dropped a link to the handout in the chat box there, but we'll also send that out when we send out the recording in a few days. Um, all right, our next question is from Diane. 
Diane would like to know what other cover crops uh, are there besides buckwheat? I'm allergic <laughs> to buckwheat, so I'd like to try using cover crops this year. Thank you. Some, oops, sorry. Uh, so some, there are some people who use peas. Some people will use, sorry about that. Some people use peas. Some people use an annual rye grass. Um, and that dies back. So then you can just plant in the rows, you may have to dig up a little bit to plant your seeds and your plants, but that annual rye dies back. So there's annual rye, so there's peas, which are an annual. Some people even, um, well, they'll use radishes to kind of improve the soil during the growing season, especially the daikon radishes that are deep, that are will break down the soil. Um, and then they decompose over winter, and then your soils improve, the drainage is improved as well. Um, if you have a small lot, um, a couple of places, I'm seeing more cover crops available for sale through garden catalog. So Renee's garden has a mix of peas, ryegrass, and I forget what the third one is for small areas. That's Renee's garden. Gurney's, I think, has several, I think it was Gurney's I saw had several different mixes of cover crops. If you live in the country, a lot of the seed providers uh, that sell to farmers um, will provide it. We have a sod dealer um, uh, that grows cover crops and he sometimes will sell to some of the landscapers. So you might check uh, places selling seed bulk seed, check some of the seed catalogs, especially those growing some that provide some unusual plants. But I know Renee's has a small bag they sell. Gurney's, I don't know if Young's, J-U-N-G sells it in the chat. If anyone else knows, type it in. Kelly will read it to us. Um, but ask around because it's like Kelly was saying about native plants. I'm seeing more and more cover crops available, which, you know, 10 years ago, you didn't see any. And now I'm starting to see catalogs sell it and even garden centers offer some mixes. So our next question from Mary. Um, actually is related. What cover crop would you suggest for a small garden where tomatoes are planted? And then um, she says, yes, I know I should rotate um, kind of plants out, but I have no place to rotate the tomato plant to. Um, do you till the cover crop under? Good question. So when I was a city gardener, my rotation was one end to the other, and I grew tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants in my small garden because I made ratatouille, and those were the ingredients. But I didn't have problems because I built my soil. So I did incorporate compost initially. I used organic mulches. Um, you know, you do want to remove the plant debris in the fall because if there is any disease in there, it stays in the soil, can reinfect the plant. You could do something like an annual rye that, you know, again, the, one of the concerns is, okay, the idea is we don't want to disturb the soil. So if you do a cover crop, you either need to till it in. What a large, lot of farmers and large scale growers are doing is they then kill it with Roundup, which kind of defeats the purpose that the reason most of you are here because you don't want to use those chemicals. And so doing an annual rye, uh, peas will die out too. So you could either just cut it at ground level and then, you know, dig your hole for your tomato and put your tomato in. Clover is very good at fixing nitrogen, but it's very aggressive and it's perennial. And so it's only a place that you would want to do, maybe mix it in your lawn or your pathways if you could keep it out of your garden beds. Um, so those would be some of the things. So look for those annual crops. Um, cover crops are, you really need to start it. So you're going to plant your garden this year. So it's good you're planting ahead and then you'll plant in the fall, your cover crop in the fall. So come next spring, it'll be ready to either till under, if it's one that needs to be tilled under, you'll be adding the organic matter directly. Or if it's an annual crop, you can cut it back or it'll be dead and just plant in amongst it. That dead stuff acts as a mulch as well, eventually decomposes. Um, cover crops are something I need to, to to learn more about as well. I think, you know, it was an old practice that's coming back in vogue, which is great because I think we're finding the benefits. So good questions. And Mary, you just do the best you can. And if your tomatoes end up diseased, you may have to rotate into a pot for a year. 
Um, but it sounds like as long as they're healthy and you keep your soil healthy, I had great luck. I lived in that house for 26 years and I planted tomatoes in the same bed every year because that was the spot to grow them. So um, just work on that soil, you'll be amazed. Laura would like to know, uh, well, she says, I have a wood burning stove. Are these ashes okay to add to the compost? And if so, is there a recommended ratio of wood ash to other materials? That's a great question. So wood ash, and, and obviously if you're burning it, it doesn't have any preservatives or things that would be bad for you. And so wood ash is fine. It tends to be alkaline. So I don't like to recommend using it on sweet or alkaline soil. So much of Southeast, most of Southeast Wisconsin is alkaline. And so adding it, it doesn't really improve drainage, but putting it in the compost pile is a great use for that. And then I would just, I don't have a ratio, but what I would do if it was me, is just sprinkle it light, just as if you were fertilizing the soil over the various layers. So you're layering it instead of one big clump, spread it out in the different layers if you're layering your compost, or I'm guessing you're emptying it out, you know, have a bucket, spread it out as you're adding more material. So if you spread it out with a fine layer, kind of like you're salting, you know, you're, well, you shouldn't salt your food that heavily, but spreading like malorganite fertilizer over the soil surface, that will give you enough, it'll spread it out and then try to spread it out throughout the layer as well. Mara would like to know, what are those orange co uh, collars around the food garden tomato plants? Oh, those, okay. So um, I'm guessing those were the ones in Dawn's garden. And those are called tomato boosters. And um, Roy Ryman, who founded Birds and Blue magazine, invented these. And the idea is they capture the water, but they also... Uh, mulch the soil around the plant. And there was research out of, I think it was Cornell or Rutgers University that found that red mulches reflected the light and boosted productivity of tomatoes and peppers. So I met the guy that was manufacturing them for Roy and I was kind of skeptical. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he gave me some to try. So I planted most of my tomatoes and a couple of weeks later, I planted one or two with those tomato boosters and they surpassed the ones I planted. And I'm a late planter, so I know the soil was warm when I planted, but it warmed the soil, it captured the moisture right above the roots and it reflected the light in a way that it boosted productivity. So I, I use them sometimes, I don't always, depends on I, you know my time and what's what I have in my shed to, as I'm planting, but they're called tomato boosters. I did use the wall of water that was red um, to jumpstart the season in a video I did. It worked great. So um, I do that occasionally when I'm trying to jumpstart the growing season. I'll use those red wall of waters and they worked really well for jumpstarting. They held the heat by the plant and then the red reflected. And that was one of the best ways I jumpstarted the season. So we've got um, uh, this cover crop tips in the chat. Denise oh, good. Says, High mowing organic seed cells for cover crops. Thank you so much. And that's maybe so I see this is what I love about it, right? Your patrons, gardeners always share great information. So thank you for jumping in with that information. Thanks, Denise. All right. Next question is from Lynn. Uh, Lynn says, part of my yard is being take, take, taken over by creeping bellflowers and growing the oh. plants that I want. Suggestions on how to do away with them. Creeping bellflower. Oh, yes. It spreads by rhizomes that are deep and vigorous. Um, you've probably tried digging. If you try smothering, the problem is you've got good plants in amongst it. So here's a couple of things for any really invasive, aggressive plant, you're trying to take your garden back. Um, if it's intermixed and you're like, there are more weeds than perennials, you might want to dig your perennials you want to keep, check for the rhizomes from the weed, in this case, the creeping bellflower, pot it up in a, a container and then watch for any sprouts of that in case you missed any. Then edge the garden bed, cover it with clear plastic, 
the days, the amount of time varies. Um, Kansas State recommends six to eight weeks during the hottest part of the season. And yes, I know for those of us in the Midwest and the upper Midwest, that's a good portion of our growing season. Um, and they recommend leaving it in place and that'll heat up the soil, kill the plants, the rhizomes, weed seeds and things. So at least six to eight weeks. You might even wanna do a whole season. That cooks things where black plastic will suffocate. Sometimes there's enough stored energy that one season covered with black plastic isn't enough. We edge the garden in case there's any un, you know, weeds on the outside of the garden bed we didn't see so that they're not feeding what's underground and keeping them alive till you remove the plastic. Um, then you could replant, but monitor, monitor, monitor. Okay, so Organic plant killers use uh, plant oils, they use um, vinegars, things like that to burn the top, but it doesn't kill the roots. So cutting them back continually, getting it all so that you're starving it to death, but that can take years and they're kind of sneaky as you probably know. So you'll miss one or two, they'll put energy back in and, and you're not getting ahead. Um, if you don't mind kind of intervening, um, just once or twice with a total vegetation killer finale. If you don't want to use Roundup, they have different modes of operation. Um, what you can do is cut a soda bottle or milk jug, put it over your good plants. If you've got more weeds than good plants and spray the weeds so you're protecting the good plant. Once it hits the soil, it won't be absorbed by the roots and kill your good plants. It's absorbed by the leaves of the weeds, goes down, kills the root system, may take several applications, even with total vegetation killers. Or if you have few weeds and more good plants, cover the weed with the milk jug with the bottom removed, spray through the opening so you let it drip dry, then move to the next weed. I know that's using a chemical that we're all trying to avoid. Um, but the other option is just the smothering, like I mentioned, or digging, 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 but you've got to take all the bits of the rhizome and it's a tough one. So I, 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 I feel bad for you. I'm fighting bindweed, which is a different weed, but ew, equally as irritating. So good luck with that. See if we have a few more questions here. Uh, Rita says, I have a lawn hillside where grass is not growing. It is next to a city sidewalk. I want to cover it with cardboard that plant ground cover. Do I add compost first, then wood chips before planting? Also, do I need some kind of barrier next to the sidewalk, like a couple inches of grass so plants don't get into the sidewalk? So, <sighs> Here's one of the one of the challenges with cardboard and mulch is I would probably do newspaper if you can find any newspaper these days. Cardboard can be pretty slippery and I'm worried your mulch will roll down if it's a steep slope will will slide down the the cardboard and end up on the sidewalk. Um, depending on how steep it is, um, you may just want to use a ground cover. Um, I liked my plants spilling over my sidewalk when I was in the city. I had a neighbor who kept saying, I'll edge your yard for you. And I'm like, no, I like it. <laughs> but that's a matter of what you want to look at. Um, and depends on your neighborhood too. The other benefit of leaving just a strip of grass is that is a way to help keep the mulch and the soil in place. One of the things, the benefit of cutting the grass short but leaving the roots intact, that'll help hold the soil in place or the weeds intact. Newspaper, wet it down and then maybe do leaves or something or shredded bark that tends to knit together so it doesn't slide down or by the time you put your plants in, that'll help hold the mulch in place. I think cardboard, I like cardboard. It lasts a long time, but I'm afraid your mulch will slide down. So part of its aesthetics, part of its keeping that mulch in place. Um, one of the gardeners, um, I Sanger House, if you get a chance when he has open doors and garden visits, cool place in the city of Milwaukee. He found old curbing material and he used that along the sidewalk. His, his yard is really steep, looks very nice. He does tons of recycled products in his garden, beautiful gardens. He's on like third and Palmer. So Sanger House, check that out. You know, follow him on Instagram or Facebook. You'll find out when he has open, you can visit his gardens. He's 
he's very generous with his time in his garden. It's just beautiful. But yeah, you might want something to help hold that mulch in place off the sidewalk. I had good luck. Mine wasn't real, real steep, but I had fairly good luck. But I slowly, gradually extended the garden until I got to the sidewalk. Question from Lisa. Um, her question's about the frost-free season um, and that it's getting longer, leading to earlier and potentially longer allergy seasons. Um, pollen from trees, ragweed, et cetera, is what causes allergies during a specific time of year. Can these types of plants and trees produce pollen or buds more than one time a year? If not, then how would this elongate allergy season if the allergens are only released once? Good question. So kind of think about, so depending on where you live, we had very warm weather, then we had cooler temperatures. We had trees flowering for a longer period of time. So they started earlier so they could flower longer. You know, um, if you think about crab apples are easy to visualize. So if we have um, a cool spring, but warm, it starts early and it, it, they bloom longer. They flower more because they have a longer growing season. So they're more vigorous. So they're producing more flowers, more pollen. Ragweed, yes, ragweed causes hay fever, but they sometimes can extend the bloom time and extend the time they're producing pollen. More are growing more vigorously. Vigorous plants will flower more, produce more pollen. So that's kind of what we're seeing. And then because it's a longer season, so it's, they're different, like grass is one of my allergies. And so if grass is blooming, it may flower several times a year. So it depends on the plant that's causing it. And part of it's the vigor of the plants, part of it's extending the, the bloom times overlapping so there's more pollen um, available. So um, there's some studies that have been come out by the National Allergy Association um, or some group like that that have been studying the quantity of pollen and the impact on allergies. So good question. And a little more detail on that. Um, I try to put a lot of links in because there's a lot of science behind some of these. And it was, a you know, I already talked more than my time I should have. And I want to make sure you had the resources so that you could do a little more research easily on your own. Let's see a couple more questions here. Um, let's see, Jill would like, or Jill says, I have wild violets in the lawn. Are they good or invasive? Wild violets are and are considered a lawn weed by people who don't want violets in their lawn. Violets do spread two ways. They colonies get bigger and then they shoot seeds out and start new colonies. So kind of like dandelions and clover, they're considered weeds if they're not where you want them growing. Um, and so a lot of people, a lot of the bee lawns, they're encouraging people to have violets. There are native violets as well. And so that's one of those. It's, I think it becomes a problem if you don't mind it being in your lawn, if it goes in the garden, then it may be an issue. Some people don't mind them. Some people hate them. They are hard to manage. They're a hard weed to manage. So it's a plant, a weed is a plant out of place. An invasive one is one that goes into our native spaces. There are some native violets as well. So um, I haven't seen the violets listed as an invasive plant. Um, again, depending on if it's the native variety. So that might be an option for you, leaving it in the lawn if you don't mind. So one good for the pollinators, lawn lovers may not be happy with it. All right, a uh, couple more questions if that's okay with you. Yeah, it's good with me. Thank you, okay. Kelly, for going a bit longer. For sure. All right, Christopher would like to know, can I use cover crops in my raised beds after harvesting? A great place to do it because I find I have raised beds and I find it challenging to try to amend them and keep the weeds down. So cover crops, one of the other things I didn't mention is they do crowd out weeds. So that's a great, great idea. So cover crops in a raised bed, great way to improve the soil, put nutrients back in and help suppress those weeds. Good question. I'm glad you asked. Sarah would like to know or um 
suggests in place of newspaper, you can use the paper they use to protect floors during construction. I think it's red oh. rose paper and recommended by No Weed Gardener. Can't think Thank of his you. name, but PhD and heard in MG presentation. And then um, Sarah says, thanks, Melinda, into the library for another good program. Well, you're welcome. And thank you for that. I love always getting those tips. So maybe the key is finding, making that connection with one of the companies that lays carpet or if you know someone, um, you know, there's so many options out there. That's a great, great suggestion. Like all of them, I thank you all that asked good questions so that we could cover more information and shared your tips too. It's always helpful. Looks like one more from Karen. Um, what is the best soil mix for planting tomatoes in containers? So, you know, it is always a challenge. Um, I used to be, um, I would mix a third topsoil, a third compost, and a third something like a vermiculite or um, rice hulls if you want to go organic. And then it was hard to find good quality topsoil. Um, so I right now use a product called Sue, H-S-U, um, that is, uh, has a little bit of peat, but it's mostly compost um, and some other organic material and rice hulls for drainage. It's OMRI certified organic, and that's the company that's looking at um, trying to find ways to make sure that they're managing yard waste that they're composting to not introduce jumping worms. Um, Whitney, Far I had this great raised bed mix and I um, last year it was from miracle Grow, and it had an alfalfa meal and compost and some wood product and things. I used it in a raised bed. You could probably amend it with a little compost or add maybe rice hulls, or if you don't mind using vermiculite or perlite for drainage um, mixed with that. Whitney Farms um, has that. I, Whitney Farms is owned by Scott's who owns miracle Grow, who owns most of horticulture. Um, and, but I think they put it under that Whitney Farms because I'm guessing people who bought miracle Grow weren't buying organic products as much. And under Whitney Farms, which is known for their organic sustainable um, practices. And I found that at my Ace Hardware recently. So I just bought a bunch of bags to use to amend my raised beds, to use in my lasagna garden mixes. Um, so, I haven't used it as a pot, as a potting mix. Um, it's, you know, one of the things is finding what works for you. I'm good at watering. Uh, Ebert's Greenhouse Village, their staff uses a pro mix. It's all core, C-O-I-R, which are the husks of coconuts, uh, vermiculite, and I think it might have some composted wood products. They swear by it, love it. I used it, it didn't match the way I garden. It doesn't mean it's not a good product. It means it wasn't good for the way I garden, but it worked great for them. So you may wanna try that if it's just a, sold as a pro mix. So depending on where you live, I'm sure your garden center has something similar, if not that brand. Um, one of the things is finding what works for the way you water and the way you garden. So. Um, I opt for the organic because at the end of the season, I dump them into my compost pile or I'll even dump them into my raised beds in the fall, let them decompose, rake out any of the debris I don't want, spread it over the surface. And that's one way I repurpose my potting mix so that investment goes further. I feel, I don't feel so bad spending the money on that, that potting mix. One final question for tonight um, sure. from Terry. Terry asks, is there a bagged compost brand you would recommend to top dress my flower bed? Thank you. Um, actually, no. Um, if Sue actually does, I would find out, I'd get their custom blend um, of their leaf compost. It's pretty heavy. I have not honestly found, uh, I had a master gardener tell me they found jumping worms and bagged mulch. So I'm not sure about the bag compost. One thing you could do with bag compost though, especially if it was in a clear bag or put it in a clear bag or put it in a put it in a clear bag, set it out and let it cook for a couple of weeks. That might be a way because if you spread it out, I know that seems like a lot of work, but if you get jumping worms, that's a pretty 
devastating thing. That might be one way to solarize. If you pile it, that would work as long as it's not on soil, where if you have jumping worms, they're going to invade. Maybe put it in a swimming, a kid's swimming pool. So you've got that plastic around it, um, you know, in the sides so that you could put it in there, cover it with plastic and cook it. That might be a way to do it. I don't know of any brands. Um, check HSU if, if, it's sold in your area, but find out if it's the custom blend, co custom treated compost um, that they're treating to make sure there are no jumping worms in it. So I wish I had some better information because it's, I, again, I think the more we ask, the more likely we're going to have people providing jumping worm free compost. Right, so that wraps it up for this evening. Um, again, we'll be sending out that handout in your follow-up email along with the link to the recording. Um, and then Melinda, if, if someone has a question that wasn't answered tonight, where can they send that? Send it to info at melindamyers.com. Diana on my team puts them in a folder for me and I'm work my way through them. So I wanna thank you all that are still with Kelly and I and Kelly too, especially for hanging in there. Every week I try to be timely, but there's just so much I want to share and learn from all of you. So thank you all for joining us. I hope we you join us in the fall and you go to your local library and take advantage of all the cool things they do and the resources available. Thank you, Melinda. Yeah, we'll send out a link to to the um, September webinar or yeah, the webinar that um, will also be free to sign up for. Right. So keep an eye out for that. Um, but thanks, Melinda, for plugging the libraries. Um, we have all kinds of resources about gardening and sustainability topics. We also have a monthly climate action book club that meets online. So um, yeah, if you're interested, check that out, please. And um, yeah, we'll send everything in a follow-up email. Thanks to everyone for spending your evening with us. Yes. We appreciate it so much. And thanks to Melinda. Um, thank you so much for sharing your evening and expertise with us here. We really love learning and we're so happy that you join us time and time again. My pleasure. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care. Always a pleasure. Thanks. Bye-bye, everyone. Goodbye.